Good morning and welcome to Mornings with Mary. This morning we are going to talk about when your child has mental illness and this is sort of how it makes you feel. So I thought it was rather appropriate. So to get things started, hello there. We're going to, as always, if you're new, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Hit hashtag replay. You guys know the, know the gig. So I want to get right into it this morning and see what it's like and talk about what it's like when your child has mental illness. Now, Elizabeth here has bipolar 2, PTSD from early childhood trauma and school. Oh gosh, what else? Anxiety, depression on top of bipolar. Um, and what am I missing? Those are like the major. Those are like the major ones. Then there's some learning disabilities. I really don't count learning disabilities as mental illnesses. They're no. they're like on a different grade. Like you uh -huh. can't take a medication because you're dyslexic. Sorry. So all of all of Elizabeth's life she was a little left of center. She just wasn't like everyone else. I'm still like that. I know, but I'm saying when you were little, when you were little, like you were super sensitive, um, anger would flare like that, like Yep. At four years old, she put a hole through a wall. With my fist. Yeah, she was an itty bitty little thing. Of course, she was on albuterol, but still the point being is that her, her temper would flare like crazy really fast um she couldn't control it she was frightened S severe separation anxiety severe school anxiety severe social anxiety um what else am i missing a lot of those are still ringing true yeah they're just not controlling your life yeah and that's what i want to talk about i want to talk about so you let's say you have this child who's really struggling and as a parent it's absolutely heartbreaking because you can't fix it like it, you feel like when you're a parent that you have to be the carpenter on the fixer. Yep. And you can't. Nope. You can bring them to the doctor. You can try to make sure you get the right medications. If your child is struggling with anxiety, depression, schizophrenia, any kind of mental illness, take note of this. There is a test called Gene Sense. I believe it's G E N E S E N S E. Look it up. Um, what they do is they actually will just do a saliva swab to make sure that the medication that your child is on is the right one for them. So then there's, there is no playing Russian roulette with their brain. Because a lot of times, I know that was my fear. Yeah. Is that we would like be trying these meds and they would work or they wouldn't work and all that up and down and stuff. Gene Sense got rid of all of that. And we were really able to pinpoint what meds would be best for Elizabeth and be able to, we actually did it for Sarah because she shows signs of anxiety and we wanted to do it before the hormones hit and made her crazy so that we would know going right into puberty if her anxiety is neurological and not caused by her vision disorder, what meds would and wouldn't be best for her. So we found out, for example, Sarah can't take Prozac. This one here, Prozac's just fine, but she can't take um, Xanax. So go figure. And we found that out the hard way, actually. She ended up having all of the call the emergency room um, side effects to it. You yeah. don't want that. Go with Gene Sense. Usually it's covered by insurance. And um, nine out of ten times, the government even covers it. So if you are on government assistance for, for insurance, definitely look into that. Yes, it's super, super, super important. The other part of when your child has mental illness is learning to take care of yourself. And as a mom, that's really hard. And as a sister, it can be really hard, too. Oh, tell me more. Uh, watching Sarah go into panic attacks. I'm not sure if mm. it's, like, a mental illness for her or yeah, not. Yeah, we, we don't know yet. But when she goes into panic attacks, I get angry. I, I, I don't know what to do. Yeah. Because her anxiety is different than mine. Yes. And it flares up differently than mine. And yes. hers comes out differently than mine. Mine, I don't like to be touched. I just sit in the corner, rocking like a two-year-old. Yeah, because you are a sensory avoider. Yeah, and with Sarah, yes. she will start freaking out, crying, wanting to be held. She's a sensory seeker. And so, I... And it's hard when you both are having panic attacks at the same time. Yeah. And we're alone. Yeah. Because mom and dad went out to go to the doctors. It's an unusual thing that we actually leave them alone for prolonged periods of time simply because we know of Lizzie's challenges and we know of Sarah's challenges. So it's not something that we often do. No, um, but I'm talking about the time in, um... In the last couple weeks. When we went to the homeschool day at Turtle Island Preserve. 
Yes. That's a good example. Yes. So we had to go to the hospital. Rich was going into anaphylactic shock. So we had to go to the hospital. There was no choice. There wasn't like, I can wait for this to pass. And we were renting a cabin in the middle of the mountains down a really tiny windy road with drop-offs on both sides and washouts in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. And Sarah was convinced that we would be killed and die if we drove up and down this road and that daddy was going to die and that I was going to die and that they were going to die. And poor Elizabeth had to handle it on her own because we didn't know how long we'd be at the hospital and we didn't want to bring Sarah to the hospital and Elizabeth to the hospital for all the germs that are in the hospital. So at one point I had Sarah texting me hysterical. I had Elizabeth texting me hysterical. And I was like, I can't leave your dad alone in the hospital. He's never been in anaphylactic shock. For me, it's, I'd be like, yeah, go right ahead. I know what's gonna happen. They're gonna give me some Benadryl. They're gonna give me some epinephrine. I'll be fine. See you later. This happens to me, what, four or five times a year? Not a big deal for me, but it was his first time. Yeah. So I had to choose between my husband who was having a panic attack, my then 11 year old who was having a panic attack, and my then 19 year old who was having a panic attack. What does a parent do? I look at the husband and say, you deal. <laughs> I'm leaving. And I did, but it turns out he got, he got discharged just as I was going out to the car. But the thing is when you're a parent and your child has mental illness, you really have to know whether they are sensory seekers, whether they are sensory avoiders. You have to have a really good team. You have to have a psychiatrist that you trust. Yes. I mean, we've been through multiple multiples. ones, and I'm just like, what, one of them told me that it was all in my head. Yeah, and it is actually. Well, it is. Yeah, it's I know it's all in my in head, head. But I mean, like, like it was psych um, psychosomatic, somatic. right? No, it was not psychosomatic. It is real. Yeah. yeah. So you really have to have a good team. You have to have a good psychiatrist. You have to have a good general practitioner who actually knows their stuff. Although you may not go to them for mental illness, they have to know how the medications that your child is on is going to, to interact mm -hmm. with other, you know, if they get strep throat, mm -hmm. because there are meds that interact. Let's see, you are on Prozac, Propranolol, and Abilify? Yep. So, and we actually, for years, I was fighting, believe it or not, I was fighting for a diagnosis of bipolar for her. Now, not that I really wanted her to have bipolar, but because she fit the markers perfectly. And no one wanted to give that to a 12, 13, 14, 15 year old. And I was like, guys, I can't get her the right help if you don't give her the right diagnosis. And I had to go into these psych wards because she was hospitalized, was it three or four times? I think three. Uh, I think Silver Hill twice. Silver Hill, and then there was four wins four Silver, Silver Hill. Hill and then I, I went back to Silver Hill. So yeah, four so four times. times. So Silver Hill is this great, amazing um, psychiatric hospital in Connecticut, in New Canaan. The day that, the first time we went was because Elizabeth was, had a plan for suicide. And she came to us, you were 13? Yep. And um, so Rich and I stayed up all night. And we, um, we called them, we explained the situation. We went, we didn't even have to go to the hospital at that point because you are under the care of a doctor who knew about your psychiatric yep. issues. He signed right off on it. He was the most amazing pediatrician. And um, signed right off on it. So we drove from Massachusetts to Connecticut, probably like 90 miles an hour because we had to be there by a 12 o'clock check-in. And yeah. as she was checking in, Catherine Zeta-Jones was checking out. So if that tells you anything about the hospital, Billy Joel has a suite there. It, it's just what it is. So we got really lucky because they were covered on our insurance. Um, and the experience there, I think, was really positive. Yeah, they, they had Can schedule. you tell us about like what helps between being in the hospital and being out of the hospital? Because what does a hospital do that's different than at home? You Besides have everything. <laughs> You have a set schedule and you have set tasks that mm -hmm. you do. Like you wake up at 7, you take your meds, then you go to breakfast at 7.30, then you have like journaling time, then you have like people bring in dogs for you to pet and they talk about how animals can help with your mental illness and your symptoms. And then we you... have two dogs. <laughs> and then they have another journal time. And you really liked making um, the boxes. Collages? Collages, yeah. Yeah, they had this whole, like, table. program and yeah. table and everything that you had crafts on. Mm -hmm. So you had puzzles, you had collages. Now you would have well, to you be have to supervised your... yes. when you use scissors. Yes. Now there were safety scissors and little kid scissors. You still had to be supervised. Yeah. 
No, what I found interesting is they took your phones. Yep. You, we actually, we didn't know this the first time she went into this, um, to the psych ward because we'd never done this before. I mean, we were fighting to save our daughter's life. We packed the clothes that we had. Well, it turns out that you can't have any clothes that have drawstrings on them in a psych ward. Never occurred to me. So we actually had to go to the consignment shop and buy her a whole new wardrobe. Yep. And I still have those clothes. You couldn't, you couldn't have zippers? Could you have zippers? I don't think you could have zippers either. No, you can either have zippers. Either. Because you could slice your wrist with a zipper. Or you could hang yourself, yourself with drawstrings. Yep. And no belts. Uh, no belts. No nope. belts. Um, so no. I don't think you could have... You couldn't have hoodies. No. Nope. I don't think you could have exposed ele um, elastics. Yeah. So that was... That was interesting. We didn't know about that. Um, and, and you couldn't have, like, stuffed animals either. Nope. That was hard. Because yeah, that was your lovey. Yeah. Like, well, you I could have smuggle this... drugs in it. Yeah. Or you could smuggle, like, a razor shark blades. or something. Uh, what I did yep. find interesting, though, is that you could have an electric razor. Yeah, because you couldn't do anything with that. Because... Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, what for me was really interesting is there was no electronics. Nope. And the so, only electronic you had was the TV, and you only watched that at night to watch one, one movie, movie that everyone mean agreed on. Like, every day. Yeah. Um, also, they had a really good, really good diet. They had a chef there that they had this great buffet. I got to hear about it all the time, and I was totally jealous. Because yeah. she was in this beautiful, like, psych ward where she got fed breakfast, lunch, and dinner. She got to go there swimming. There was a carving table. Yeah. Okay. They are not all like this. I just no, want to tell you no, that. She's Fort been Wins to some crappy ones. No, was not like that at okay. all. Oh, that um, was scary. Yes. It was scary. AF. AF for me, too. Um, so, but Silver Hill was great. So, if you are, like, in the Charlotte area and your child is over 18, um, I believe the place is called Hopewell, which yep. is similar to Silver Hill. But it's they very only take based. adults. Yes. They do gardening. They do animal therapy. They do art therapy. They do music therapy. But you have to be over 18. Yes. I don't know any other resources here in the Charlotte area just because we haven't used them. We so haven't needed them. We almost did once. Once. Once, which is but. awesome because we've been here like four years. No, yeah. no hospitalizations for four years? Yes! You also have to know when your child's triggers are. So for and whatever... what they are. Yes. So for whatever reason, um, August through October for Elizabeth, we haven't really been able to figure it out. I have some ideas. She has some ideas. You know, I know that August would be triggering back to school, but she's 20. Why would that still bother her? Um, I also know that she was molested by her father in July as a three-year-old, but he wasn't really caught or interviewed until August, and there was all this hubbub at that point. Maybe that comes into it, but she was three. You know, a lot of times I don't remember cell that. cellular memory <laughs> um, only ha it happens, obviously, in the body, but not in the brain. Yeah. So you don't know why you're reacting. Um, but those, we know those 90 days are really, really hard for Elizabeth. And we keep a real close watch on her. We make sure her diet is good. We're constantly like, are you hydrating? Where are you? Set your goals for the day. And one of the things that I learned, you know, when you come home from the hospital every time is like, Mom, I need a schedule. Amy says, impressed with how you guys share your stories. You're helping so many people. Oh, I, I'll tell you at the end of this one about, about a comment on YouTube I got this morning, which was like, or last night, which totally made my day. Um... But, you know, being able to talk about this is really important because it destigmatizes it. We need yes. to get to a point where, you know, having, it used to be having diabetes was something you kept in the closet. Now everybody's like, oh yeah, I have diabetes, I give myself insulin shots. There are, there are ads all over the place. Well, having mental illness, you know, over 85% of people suffer from anxiety and or depression. That's a huge amount. I don't know what those other like 15% are doing. That. I suffer from it on and off anyway. Um, but when it comes to children... They are, it's starting as early as kindergarten. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's crazy. Suicide rates are the highest they've ever been. So I wanna walk you guys through the different, we only have experience with two different psych wards. Something you're gonna learn if and when you ever have to hospitalize your child, you lose your parental rights. Yes. I did not know that because we'd always been to this great hospital and we could come and go during visiting hours and we had connections there. We'd known someone that had worked there for 20 years so he could sort of pull some strings here and there for us. Um, and luckily he looked like he was her biological father so we could go in and be like, oh yeah, Uncle Mike is coming. So that was kind of cool. Um, but you can't have other people visit. And then, then Rich was unemployed. And Elizabeth came to me one night at midnight. He was visiting his son in Albany, New York. And she said, Mama, I, I need to show you something. 
It's never good when your kid wakes you up at midnight and says, I need to show you something. Chances are it's not a great piece of artwork. I thought it was a great piece of artwork. It did not belong in a museum. It, a very screwed up museum. Okay. A Holocaust type museum. Yeah. Um, it was 200 cuts from wrist to elbow on both arms. Yeah. Yeah. So I got up. I gave her a hug. I thanked her for showing me and for trusting me. I told her that at this point I had no choice. I had to hospitalize her because I couldn't keep her safe at home. And I made a pot of coffee. I called Rich, let him know what was going on. She fell asleep on my lap crying. on the couch crying. I drank an entire pot of coffee by myself, which is a lot. I normally maybe drink one or two cups a day. I called the insurance company and because he was unemployed, we were on government assistance. And the nearest hospital that would accept her was something called Four Winds. Well, Four Winds used to be a great hospital. You notice that past, that past tense, right? So we go there, we bring her. It was terrifying. There Beyond was terrifying. screaming. There was fist fights breaking out. I got locked in my room yep. because there was some girl that wanted to kill another and she was running after her with a knife. Yep, you were getting threatened to be raped by the girls there. Yeah. I, I tried to fight to get her out and they said if I, if I signed her out, because I didn't know I'd lost my parental rights, they explained that to me. If I signed her out, they would have me arrested. So I had to keep her there for 10 days days yeah it was the worst 10 days of my life i can't speak for her since i wasn't there i'd go to visit her and she would be so pissed at me she wouldn't even talk to me i mean it was horrible and, and terrifying but a positive thing came out of that what's that uh so after i got checked in there a few days later my friend got checked in there too yeah. and um that's really how we started our friendship. I mean, we had gone to school together. I had seen her in the hallways, but... There was no friendship. Yeah. It was just you were... It was just like I knew, knew of, of her. her. Yeah. But it was funny because I... So there's this check-in area, mm. like the main room, and then there's a hallway. Mm -hmm. She was standing in the hallway. I remember that. I was standing... In the check-in. In the check-in. Yeah. And we look at each other and we're, we're just like... like I know you. I know, but then you had to act like you didn't know each other. Yeah, and then we like completely ignored each other. And then yep. one night, we sat next to each other at a movie. Because they always play a movie at the end of the day. And we started talking, and we're still like really good friends now. Like, we still talk. We still... Yep. Her mom is actually the one who told me three years ago that you were cutting again. Yeah. And that... Because her mom and I kept in touch. And Miss Elizabeth here... Um, they say that struggling with cutting is worse than struggling with an addiction to heroin. It is very difficult. I'm going to guess will... it's because heroin, you have to go out and buy it. Cutting, your body's right there. Yeah. And unless you are in a room that has nothing in it, you, no, have, you, you can have full even access find to something you have your there. nails. You have your teeth. I mean, yeah. you're never without the ability to do it. Yeah. And so this particular girl's mom was like, she, she I am to be on Facebook. She's like, hey, Mary, did you see what Liz posted on um, Instagram. on Instagram? And I was like, no, I'm not. I'm not part of her Instagram. She's like, she she's cutting again. She's she's showing how she's cutting. I don't know if I was more upset that she was cutting again. I think it's more. I was upset that she didn't trust me to come to me and say that she was struggling. I knew she was struggling, but when you know the thing is this: when you have a child with mental illness, there's nothing you can do to stop it. You cannot stop their cutting. You cannot stop their not eating. You cannot stop their anxiety. You cannot stop their depression. You just have to sit back and watch them spiral out of control until they're ready to accept help. And that is the worst feeling in the world. Worst, because there's nothing you can do. You can fight with them, you can buy safes, you can put every sharp in your house in that safe, they'll find a seashell. Um, they'll find something, they'll find a blade on the ground outside. I mean, they will find something. And until they're ready to Where help there's themselves. there's a will, there's a way. Yeah, negative or positive. Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, what's really neat now, though, is I think, you know, I went up that morning and I was like, hey, you need to show me your shoulders and the cuts That is not what happened. Yes, it was. I was no. like, hey, hey, Becky. I was like, you need to show me because I heard you're, you're cutting again. Yeah. And you I pulled back. You ripped me out of bed. And it wasn't that violent. Yes, it was. Okay. You in my ripped memory. the blankets off oh, of my I bed. that I did do. Yes. You're just like, you have to show me your cuts right now. Wake up. Yeah. And I, I was like half awake, half asleep, and I was like, what? 
And you're just like, I know you're cutting again. Yeah. I was... Show me I your was pissed. Because I was terrified. So I showed her and she just got really angry. Oh, yeah. And then she sobbed. Yeah. And I just like... In those you, situations, like, I, sh- you, I, I shut down. Yeah. I get angry and then I shut down. Yep. Because I don't know how to handle... Yeah. The situations. Even though I had been there multiple times before. And you had created it yourself. I didn't know how to handle the reactions and the responsibility of having to deal with whatever I had just done. And what did I tell you in that moment? I don't remember. Oh, yes, you do. That was when I said, if you're going to continue to do this, it's all on you. Go for it. She looked me in the eye. And she was all teary, and she said something along the lines of, if you're going to continue to do this, then I I have to accept the fact that I may wake up one day and you will just be dead. Yeah. I have to accept the fact that I can look myself in the mirror every day and say I did my best. Yep. It's pretty horrible. And I still know that. Like, on days when you're really struggling... And there are times it still happens, not that you're cutting with days that you're really struggling, that when I go out or Rich and I go out, I don't know if I'm going to come home to a live child. And it's terrifying. I am well aware that every single day you choose to spend on this earth may be your last. Because you may choose at any time. The disease may win. Yeah. Not that you're weak. Not that, that you're flawed, but the disease may win. And at some point, someday, you may decide the fight is too much. And I've never, never lost sight of that. And when you have that as your reality, it really changes how you parent. It's like, what's really important? Is fighting over a class important? No. Is fighting over whether or not you're going to pierce what part of your face important? No. It's really not. So you have to understand that every day, whether your child has mental illness or not, every day you are given with that person in your life, child, spouse, parent, whatever your relationship is, it's a gift. Yeah. And you really have to understand that it is a limited time offer with an unknown expiration date. Yeah. Why you look so sad? Because I don't want you to have that fear still, but even I still have that fear when I'm struggling. Yeah. Because that so many years of struggling and the first thought is just kill yourself. It'll be easier. Yeah. You won't have to deal with anything. Yeah, and so in five years will it matter exactly what is your child's worth? Exactly, Becky. Exactly. Yeah. And you really have to start examining that. You know, if you find your you know, totally get him been there, yeah. And it changes everything, everything. Like how important is it that they, they left the cookie stuff on the counter? Is it important to teach them to clean up? Yes, it is. But is it going to matter in five years? Probably not. It, it gives a different weight yeah. to, to the world and to what you react to and to what you do. I think it gives it a heavier weight. In some ways, yes, but in some ways it releases you because then you don't need to get upset over all this little piddly shit that society tells you to get upset about. Like, oh, they colored their hair. Oh, they got tattoos. Oh, they pierced something. Who the hell cares? It's their body. Is it harming them? No, it's not. Is it encouraging them to be who they are? Yes, it is. Roll with it. Now, I know recently you have changed what you've chosen to do and how you've chosen to live your life. So can you give us some examples of what's working for you? Yes. I would love to hear them. Okay, so for the past, it's been like a week now. I know, it's been a week. High five. We're doing, going on seven days of yeah. good things. And every day, celebrate. And if you have a back, you know, if you walk back, it's okay. Just pick yourself up and keep going. Dust your knees off and go. So what I've been doing, which has really been helping me, is... Um, <laughs> Makes his mom in trouble if colored hair is a problem. Yeah, I know, girl. Rock your neon self. That's awesome. I love it. (laughs) But what I've been doing, I've been keeping a positivity journal. So every morning I wake up, I have some coffee, and I sit down and I write my morning affirmations. Like, I'm loved, I will live a productive life, I'm cherished, and I can be myself without being apologetic. And then, in the afternoon, 
I write positive things that have happened so far. So the other day I had gone to coffee with my dad and we had a really great conversation. We had a great time. We hung out for like an hour, hour yeah, and, and a half. half. Yeah. And we just sat there talking and that, that was really awesome. That was like the highlight of my day. Yeah. That was the highlight of his day too, which was awesome because I felt like, yay. Um, and then at the end of the day, I before I go to bed, I sit down, I open up my positivity journal, I read over what I had written that day mm -hmm. or the previous days, and I'll write again positive things that happened in my day. Yeah. So by doing that, I start off my day with positive thoughts, and I end my day with positive thoughts. And you're creating new pathways in your brain. Because yes. every thought that we think creates like a road. And so your brain's sort of like this map of thoughts. And if you're constantly giving it a map of thoughts of negative thoughts, you're not going to get any positive. Exactly. It's sort of. I think of it sort of like you know, um, Sleeping Jer Sleeping Beauty and Maleficent, right? They have all those vines that are pokey and destructive, and it leads only to a dark, negative, scary place. Yeah. But if you start putting positive thoughts in there and making a positive neurotransmitter path. Sooner or later, it's going to get easier and easier to go there. And you're going to have less fighting of the dragon of negativity and more just walking into the garden of positivity. Oh my god, that was good. <laughs> Sometimes I just amaze myself. Yes. Anyway. But, like, oh, I came up with, like, this really great thought, but now I forget. It happens. Do you remember it? Uh, something about... I, I would mention dragons and gardens. No. Okay, it's gone. I forget. Anyway, so we are going to wrap up. But I wanted to tell you something that I thought was really cool. So last night I was going through my emails like I do before bed, about an hour before bed. And there's this notice from my YouTube channel, which I'm like, who even watches that? I have like 19 subscribers. And there's this kid who watched a video of Liz and I talking about her bullying experience in school and how homeschooling saved her life. And this kid was like, hey, this is like, this is exactly what I'm going through. Thank you so much for this. I'm going to show this to my mom because I think homeschooling might help save my life. How awesome is that? I thought, I was like, oh, absolutely. So tomorrow, if you guys are obviously watching this on the replay at this point, Rich is going to be on with me. And he's going to talk about the fears that men have for self-led learning and bringing your kid home. I know. Can you believe it? We're going to have the man here. He, he can talk. You're going to say the man point of view. And do you know what it all comes down to? Fear. The money, the money, the money. Oh. It all comes down to the money. How can they be happy if they're not going to be able to make the money? I thought that was I'm going to watch that. I know. You might That's be going to be interesting. Yeah, it all came down. So I asked him all the questions yesterday so he could sort of understand where we're going to go. And he doesn't process as fast. He needs time to think. Yeah. So. So I did that. And then the rest of this week, we're gonna, so today we take on mental illness. Tomorrow we're going to take on the guy's point of view. Then Wednesday and Thursday, believe it or not, guys, I'm actually remembering this. Wednesday and Thursday, we're going to take on self-led learning through middle school on Wednesday and through high school on Thursday. Because I want you to understand there's a difference between radical unschooling and self-led learning. One has no goals and you're just learning as you're going. And the other has goals and tasks. There is a difference, all right? Same thought process that it's child driven, but one has an end result and a goal, one does not. Totally fine, just whatever makes you feel better. We're gonna talk about the one that has tasks and is goal driven, okay? Um, then Friday we'll do the recap. Take a, take a hop by maryharrington.com because there's some new blog posts over there. There's also a free Homeschool 101 binder, whoop! Homeschool 101 binder and you can get the first chapter of From Stress to Best and if you have been wanting to work from home, there's actually a free download of the Brawless Visionary on the Freebies page. So the Brawless Visionary has helped over 2,500 women around the world. I still have to take, go through that. I know. Take their passion to idea from implementation so that you can work from home and not have to sell multi-level marketing stuff. All right? Or yourself. Yeah, that, that's true. Yeah. I'm totally not into that. That's why I don't do like silk milk commercials. Anyway. All right. I will see you guys tomorrow with the man sitting right here. Same time. Same place. Tune in. Let me know if you watch this on the replay. Give me a thumbs up, a thumbs down. Give me your other half the heart. A heart. And let me know what you thought. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.